Hi, everyone. Welcome uh, to our Tuesday seminars today. I'm so happy to uh, hear from Daniela Popa. Daniela, she received her MD from uh, in Bucharest and then did a PhD in the University of Paris in neuroscience and pharmacology, then went uh, to New Jersey to Rutgers uh, to uh, do a postdoc with Dennis Perre, and she's now back in Paris, a group leader at uh, Ecole Normale Superior, and she's probably one of the very few people in the world who studies uh, cere cerebrocerebellar interactions. And I, this talk in particular is of particular interest to me to listen to about how pathological conditions that affect the basal ganglia result in changes that uh, take place in the cerebellum and potentially therapeutic ways by which that uh, one can engage the cerebellum. So Daniela, thank you so much. Look forward to hearing your work. Okay, so hello everybody. So thank you very much, Reza, for this invitation and introduction. So I came later into the cerebellar community, but I'm really very happy to be part of it. And I'm also very happy to be uh, with you online today. So our team here in Paris is focusing on the study of neural interactions between the cerebellum and other brain structures in behavior. And today I will uh, present you our data. Um, on the adaptive cerebellar forebrain coupling in normal and pathological conditions. Uh, so notably motor disorders such as Parkinson's disease, dyskinesia, and dystonia. So the circuits that I will discuss today involves the cerebellum, the basal ganglia, and the cortex, which are the main players of the forebrain uh, motor circuits. And they do not work independently, uh, one from another, so they uh, can have uh, reciprocal connections. And for example, here there are the cerebellocortical reciprocal connections with the layer five neurons uh, from the cortex, five beam or the, from the cortex projecting to the pontine, and then to the cerebellar cortex and to the cerebellar nuclei. So this for the descending pathway. And then for the ascending pathway, the cerebellar nuclei projecting to the motor thalamus and then back to the cortex. We also know that there are also basal ganglia cortical loops. And in this case, the basal ganglia projects to the motor thalamus, uh, to another part of this motor thalamus that projects to the cortex. And also more recently, it has been shown that there are cerebellobasal ganglia loops. And in this case, the cerebellum uh, for the ascending pathway projects to the intralaminar thalamus that projects to the basal ganglia. So intralitra, intralaminar thalamus, uh, such as parafascicular or centralateral in uh, rodents. So we see that overall, we have a heavily interconnected network. <clears throat> but um, uh, we also know that all these structures um, are uh, used by the brain in order to uh, uh, learn and to complete efficiently motor actions. So each of them uh, has the ability to learn in order to optimize the success of a movement. And um, yet, these functions in each structures, for example, here uh, uh, in the um, uh, cerebellum or basal ganglia, yes, different neurological disorders. So ataxia for cerebellum, Parkinson's disease for basal ganglia, which can affect the other structures. So we are interested to, to see what goes wrong into the cerebellum when something goes wrong in the rest of the motor circuit. And we, uh, uh, we focused on the basal ganglia. So our working hypothesis is that the, pl the plasticity in the cerebellum continuously adapts the motor function, including when the basal ganglia are dysfunctional. And our objectives are to identify the plastic events involving the cerebellum in pathologies associated with the basal ganglia. So we looked at Parkinson's disease, at dyskinesia, and dystonia. And we did not only uh, describe these plastic events, but we wanted to use the plasticity uh, in order to correct the problems. And for this, we induced plasticity in the system through cerebellar stimulation to, to treat the disorders. So we explored the benefit of the cerebellar stimulation to reverse the motor dysfunctions. So we know already that uh, there is something happening in the cerebellum in Parkinson's disease. And if we look at the circuit in the normal state, the cerebellum excites the cortex to the motor thalamus, and then the basal ganglia inhibits the cortex to the motor thalamus. So a pathology developing in the basal ganglia <clears throat> can also show abnormal activities in the cerebellum. 
And this can be the case of Parkinson's disease, where we know that the dopaminergic depletion is in the basal ganglia, and we know there is a disruption in the basal ganglia function. So here you can see a resting state study, and here you see a hyperactivation of the pallidum in Parkinson. And also we know that there is a disruption of the cortical function. So in this case here, we see in blue, a hypoactivity of the posterior parietal cortex. However, increased metabolic activity in the cerebellum here in red is consistently observed. So uh, this was a resting state study, but uh, in the last year, more and more studies um, shown that there is abnormal uh, activities in the cerebellum also during movement. So I will introduce you to some of these studies, uh, notably imaging studies. So here, for example, you can see in red an hyperactivation of the cerebellum during the automatic execution of a learned motor sequence. Here in this study, you see two moments of the execution of the movement. And you can see here that in the control um, patients, there is an activation of the basal ganglia, but this activation disappears in the Parkinsonian patient, but there is evidence for an over-increased activity in the cerebellum compared to the control subject. At the same moment of the movement, as if it compensates for the lack of the activation of the basal ganglia. So we can see that this is transient because we do not see this anymore uh, a little later. So it must be linked to a movement and limited in time for that type of movement. So we see increased cerebral activity in the Parkinsonian patients that may reflect the redistribution of cerebral computations. So we saw abnormal activities in the cerebellum uh, during movement, but there are also during learning. So in these studies, the authors uh, perform a learning, a trial and error sequence learning, and they look here at the number of correct uh, movements to the target in Parkinsonian patients, so they are in black, and then in controls in gray. And we can see that at the beginning, uh, there is a difference between the two, but then the Parkinsonian patients can learn. And then the authors look at the activities, the brain activities, when the performance was equivalent between the Parkinsonian patients and the controls. And here they saw this overactivation bilaterally in the cerebellum. So this overactivation helps the Parkinsonian patients to perform as well as the, as the subject, uh, control subject. So we see that there are abnormalic uh, metabolic activities in the cerebellum, but not only, also in the thalamus and in the sensory motor cortex. And um, in Parkinson's disease, we know that there is this dopaminergic depletion in the basal ganglia, but it was not clear uh, if this is sufficient to induce the, the brain activities that we see in Parkinson. And we had the answer um, in a nominal model here, a neurotoxin MPTP monkeys with dopaminergic depletion, where we see the same patterns as in patients. So this shows that the dopaminergic lesions in animals MPTP monkeys here, induce similar metabolic anomalies in cerebellum, thalamus, and sensory motor cortex as in patients. And also we have a cerebellothalamo cortical covariance that can be suggestive of a functional network. So Timmerman in his study, he looked at the dynamic of this cerebellocortical uh, thalamocortical network in Parkinsonian patients with tremor and uh, he found that there is an oscillation that is synchronous at around eight hertz, so a tremor-related abnormal coupling in the cerebellothalamocortical loop. So this circuit can also be um, a therapeutical target. And this is uh, seen here in this study by Gross, uh, where they implanted electrodes in the cerebellocortical thalamic relay, which is called BIM. And they found cells related with the tremors, and then stimulation uh, in this zone will reduce the tremor. So this shows that targeting the cerebellothalamocortical pathway with deep brain stimulation can alleviate Parkinsonian tremor. So now I showed you that there are uh, modification in all these structures in the motor circuit. 
But uh, how about the cerebellocortical functional connectivity? So this in humans, it studied with uh, non-invasive transcranial magnetic stimulation. So how does it work? We can stimulate the motor cortex, and then we look uh, at an AMG response, so the motor evoked potential, and we can see here uh, a response. And then if we stimulate the cerebellum before stimulating the motor cortex, we see a decrease in this response. And this is called the cerebellar inhibition, the CBI. And this decrease depends on the um, <clears throat> delay between the two stimulations, and the cerebellum has to be always stimulated before the motor cortex in order to obtain the cerebellar inhibition. And uh, this can be explained, um, um, and it's interpreted as a, a decrease in the excitability in the motor cortex following the stimulation. And probably it's due to the fact that we stimulate purkinia cells that are inhibitory, so we have a decrease in the cerebellocortical drive. Now, what's happening in Parkinson disease with this CBI? So in this study, uh, Carillo, they look first at the normal control. So you see the same CBI as before. And then they look in Parkinsonian patients of medication, and they see a decrease in the CBI. And then Parkinsonian patient on medication, so with levodopa. So levodopa was not uh, able to restore the CBI. So we see that we have this uh, cerebellar CBI that is disrupted in Parkinson disease and suggests a functional impairment of the cerebellocortical pathway. So um, for this part, I showed you anormalous activations and activities in the cerebellocortical network in Parkinson disease, and also evidence for the cerebellocortical functional uh, disconnection in Parkinson disease. Now, what is the nature of the alterations of neural activity and functional connectivity in the cortical loop? We decided to study this phenomena in animal models where we have more possibilities of manipulation. So we use an experimental Parkinson disease model called 6 hydroxydopaminergic animal mouse. So what we do is we inject a dopaminergic toxin, the 6 hydroxydopamine in the medial forebrain bundle, and this bundle links the substantia nigra to the striatum. And then we can look at the impact of dopaminergic lesion. And to do so, we, we do the immunostaining of the tyrosine hydroxylase, which uh, is an uh, enzyme that is um, uh, essential for dopaminergic synthesis, and it's seen in dopaminergic terminals. So here we can see that in the case of the lesion, we have a diminution of the dopaminergic terminals in the striatum where we inject the toxin. So we do this unilaterally. And this has an effect on the motor um, activity. So for the motor activity, we use as a test called the use of the four pole. So what we do is that we put the mouse in a cylinder, and then we look at how it uses the four limbs. And uh, we can see that there is an increase in the use of the ipsilateral um, four limb because the contralateral is impaired because of the lesion. So we see this over weeks, these changes in the use of the four pole, and we also see changes in locomotion. So for locomotion, we do the open field. So in this case, we put a mouse <clears throat> in an open field, and then we look at his activity. And we can see here trajectories uh, for the normal mice, so here in black, in the open field over weeks, and here for the lesioned mice. So we see that we have a total decrease travel that it's decreased um, in, in the lesion uh, mice over weeks. Now, if we look at the gates, so here in red and blue, you see the four limbs and the hind limbs. And here is the same mouse before and after the dopaminergic lesion. And you can see that after the dopaminergic lesion, uh, it, the, they hesitate initiating movements so this is interpreted as akinasia, and also they have smaller steps uh, that is, are called fascination. So all this is um, consistent with the literature and confirms that uh, we have a classical model of Parkinson's disease. 
Now, what is the nature of the changes in the cerebellocortical pathways in this animal model of Parkinson's disease, where we know that we have a degeneration in the dopamine in the basal ganglia? So to answer this question, we set up electrophysiological recordings in the cortex and in the cerebellum. So here uh, we uh, perform electrophysiological electro recordings in the cerebellar nuclei and in the motor cortex in fully moving mice. So implanted electrodes that are fixed and we can follow the, the mice over weeks. And here you have examples in the motor cortex and in the cerebellar nuclei, so the interpost nucleus. And if we look at all the data, we can see here um, the classical decreased activity in the motor cortex that is observed normally in Parkinson disease over weeks. But we see an increased activity uh, in the interposed nucleus. <laughs> so we look at, uh, at this as if we can look at this as, as if the cerebellum was trying to compensate for the low uh, motor activity in the motor cortex by uh, increasing its excitatory drive. So we saw decreased activity in the cortex, increased activity in the cerebellar nuclei. But we know that the cerebellar nuclei can be influenced either by the cortex through the excitatory projection to the pontine, but also uh, they can be influenced by the proteinial activity in the cerebellar cortex that inhibit the cerebellar nuclei. So we look at the cerebellar purkinia cells activity in this model. And to do so, we, uh, um, we did this in L7 channel adopting transgenic mice um, that we uh, uh, <clears throat> um, developed here in France with colleagues. And this allows us to specifically stimulate sets of purkinia cells. So we see that each time when we stimulate, we have an action potential. And then we opt to identify the purkinia cells in this uh, animal model with the lesion uh, in the dopaminergic system. So Fabian used an optrod, and here you can see a classical purkinia cell from the cerebellum. So in the normal animals, uh, high firing, and we see that it hires even more if we are stimulating optogenetically uh, the purkinia cell. And now in the animal the lesion of Parkinson's disease, we see a decreased firing rate for some cells. We see cells with slow and irregular firing rates. And we even see uh, cells, silent purkinia cells that Fabian was uh, uh, recording uh, when he was using the intermittent uh, light uh, stimulations while he was moving down with his optrod. So we see this decrease in the purkinia cell inhibitory action uh, on the cerebellar nuclei that can also uh, sure participate to the increased cerebellar activity that we see in the cerebellar nuclei interposed. So we saw this decrease activity and also decrease activity in the motor cortex. But how is the functional state of the cerebellocortical pathway in this model? So to answer this question, so in humans, I show you that to answer such a question, we can use a transcranial magnetic stimulation and CBI. And here we uh, took advantage of the L7 channel adopting transgenic mice. So we specifically stimulate the purkinia cell in the cerebellar cortex while recording in the motor cortex. So in the previous study in the lab, we already showed that we can uh, stimulate purkinia cells and look at the motor cortex uh, and have uh, waves um, uh, that will uh, be uh, <clears throat> transferred uh, through the motor circuit. So in that study, we stimulate purkinia cells. So here we see that increase in, the, in blue, it's the stimulation. And then when we moved to the first synapse in the dentine nucleus here, we see that we have a tight inhibition and then the, start, the cells restarts firing. And when we move to the ventral thalamic, thalamic nucleus, we also see that some thalamic nucleus, the nuclei uh, cells require cerebellum in order to fire. And then in a the motor cortex, we could find this excitatory uh, um, response in the motor cortex, in the layer five of the motor cortex, where the motor thalamus projects. And then we also look at the local field potential in the motor cortex. So here we don't see much during the stimulation, but then we see developing a wave that is linked with a current uh, sink here in the layer five. So it's a local phenomena. 
So this means that um, when we stimulate working SL, we can have this inhibition excitation uh, sequence in the ascending pathway, and that uh, stimulating working SLs and recording the local free potential in motor uh, cortex, it's a good way in, uh, in the looking at the cerebral cortical functional connectivity. So it's what we did in our uh, animal model of Parkinson's disease. So stimulating purkinia cells, recording the motor cortex. So here you can see examples of the motor cortex uh, local field potential during the cerebellar stimulations. So in, in black for the controls, in red for the lesioned mice. So there is not much during. But then after the stimulation, you see this wave, as I showed you in the normal case just before. And if we look at all the animals, we see that we have a decrease in the amplitude for the lesion animals. So a depression of the cerebellar cortical pathway, which is consistent with the change that I showed you in the CBI in patients. So overall, we found that there are decreased activity in the purkinia cells, but then fast firing in the cerebellar nuclei, a slow firing in the motor cortex, despite this fast firing in the cerebellar nuclei. And also we found the reduced motor response that is evoked by cerebellar optal stimulations. So we see the presence of this compensatory adaptation here in the cerebellum following the basal ganglia lesion and the benefit potentially uh, limited by the depression of the cerebellar cortical pathway. So the cerebellar activity and its coupling to the forebrain are modified by pathological alteration in the basal ganglia. Now we ask if we can use cerebellar perturbations and their impact on the forebrain to improve the condition of patients. And two groups uh, look at the effect of cerebellar transcranial magnetic stimulations in levodopa-induced dyskinesia in Parkinsonian patients. So levodopa is the, the gold standard in Parkinson, and it works very well. But after a few years, many uh, patients uh, have abnormal involuntary movements that are also called levodopa-induced dyskinesia. And we can look at this with a score. So here you can see at the administration of the levodopa in patients in black, you see an increase in these abnormal involuntary movements over time. And then the authors perform a protocol of tetabar cerebellar stimulations less than two minutes a day during two weeks. And they could show that they have a decrease in the dyskinesia score. And even better that this decrease can stay after the end of the stimulation. So they show that there is a functional impact of cerebellar stimulation on levodopa induced dyskinesia. So now with Berenice, during her PhD, we ask if we can reproduce this therapeutic effect in rodents. And for this, we focused on a, a side effect of the levodopa, the orolingual dyskinesia. And this type of dyskinesia is also seen in mice after the administration of the levodopa. So Berenice had mice for nine weeks, and first she induced the uh, toxin, the uh, lesion with the 6-hydroxypaminergic toxin for three weeks. And then um, she uh, in, uh, gave the levodopa to have the dyskinesia, so the dyskinetic mice. And we performed the stimulation, the tabar stimulation, like in the um, patient study, but this time specifically in L7 uh, charodopsin transgenic mice, so specifically on purkinia cells in the cruise two, so the orolingual zone uh, of the cerebellum. And um, we performed this in two groups, the corrective, what we called corrective cerebellar stimulation. So we have the increase in the dyskinesia and then we start these stimulations. And we also have another group that we call preventive cerebellar stimulation. And in this case, we start the stimulations in the same time with the level dopa. So now we can look at the data. So here is the total oral levodopa induced dyskinesia score. And here you can see, so the for control uh, mice with levodopa, there is no effect. But then in Parkinsonian mice with the levodopa, we have this increase in the oral levodopa induced dyskinesia that is stable over weeks. And then with the cerebellar stimulation on the cruise 2 and purkinia cells, 
we have this uh, decrease almost down to zero of the level of this dyskinesia. And we have this effect even after the end of the stimulation. And even better, if we start the stimulation in the same time with levodopa, we can even prevent the apparition of these abnormal involuntary movements. So we see that we have this beneficial effect of the cerebellar stimulation on the levodopa in this dyskinesia. And the effect is even stronger than in patients because here we are almost down to zero with the, the oral dyskinesias. Now, what is the effect of the purkinia cell theta stimulation on the cerebellar output, the first synapse? So for this, we recorded in the interpost while stimulating with the theta burst protocol, the purkinia cells. And here you can see an example in the interpost nucleus and here the normalized responses. And you see here that we have this powerful rhythmic inhibition of the cerebellar nuclei during the uh, purkinia cell theta stimulation. So can I reproduce this therapeutic effect in rodents? Yes. And the target of the transcranial magnetic stimulation in patients is unknown. But here we show that stimulating selectively purkinia cells is sufficient to have an effect. And we also revealed that preventive stimulations exert a protective, a protective effect. Now, is this behavior effect reflected in neuronal activities? So to answer this question, Perenice, during her PhD, recorded from the motor circuit. And then to start with the interpost nucleus of the cerebellar, so here the firing rate, and here the first one corresponds to the pre-level uh, dopa phase, and then the other results correspond to the level dopa um, treatment. And one more time in controls, we see that level dopa does not induce changes in the firing rate, but then in the level dopa induced dyskinesia, we see this small decrease in the firing rate in the interpost nucleus over weeks. And uh, we see the correction of this decrease uh, um, with the corrective group, and then the prevention of this decrease in the preventive group by the cerebellar <laughs> stimulation. So the, in, in the interpost nucleus, we also look at the firing irregularity, so the CB2 of successive ISIs. And here you see examples in the level dopa induced dyskinesia group and in the control group of traces and uh, waves. And if we look at all the data, so we don't see much uh, on the level dopa activity for the control group, but then we see this increase in the firing irregularity in the interpost nucleus um, in the level dopa induced dyskinesia. And then uh, with the cerebellar stimulation, we see this decrease and we have corrective effect and we even prevent this in abnormal increase in the firing irregularity uh, when we started the um, preventive stimulation in the same time with level dopa. So we have this normalization of the aberrant pattern uh, of the activity that was observed in these dyskinetic animals in the interpost nucleus using these cerebellar stimulations. So we also look at the parafascicular thalamus and then the motor cortex. So for the parafascicular thalamus here, in the control group, we don't see uh, an effect of the levodopa. But then in the levodopa induced dyskinesia group, we see this small decrease of the activity over weeks. And once again, we see that we can prevent this with cerebellar stimulation. Now in the motor cortex, so uh, here uh, we see this decrease in the level dopa at the beginning. So the first is the one before the level dopa. So it corresponds to Parkinson's disease. So um, it's the decreased activity in the motor cortex that I present you in the study just before compared to the controls. And then we see that once we give level dopa, we have this increase uh, activity in the firing rate in the motor cortex. And here again in the motor cortex, we can prevent this uh, abnormal increase in the motor cortex firing by cerebellar stimulations. So yes, the neuronal activity in the cerebellum, parafascicular nucleus and the motor cortex is normalized after cerebellar stimulations. Now, uh, we think that the striatum is at the origin of the uh, dyskinesia. So we ask if the striatal cellular markers of dyskinesia can also be normalized by cerebellar stimulation. So in this case, we look at the striatal marker called FOSB, delta FOSB, which is causally linked to dyskinesia. And this is a transcription factor with a long lifetime in the cells. 
And he, it has been shown um, by others that this accumulates uh, in the striatum during this kinesia. And also that there is a correlation between the false B delta false B and the dyskinesia score. So we look at this false B delta false B in our animals. And here you can see in control mice 100%. And then we see this increase in levodopa induced dyskinesia. So on the lesion side compared to the control side. And then we also see that we have a cerebellar stimulation can normalize this triatom expression of the marker of the cellular activity that accumulates and participates to this kinesia. So this shows that the um, uh, false B in the striatum, so the basal ganglia activity can also be normalized. So because we know that the parafascicular uh, thal thalamic nucleus is projecting to the striatum, we ask if the effect of cerebellar stimulations can involve the cerebellum parafascicular pathway. And to answer this question, first, we look with Jimena at the cerebellar nuclei anatomical projection to the thalamic parafascicular nucleus. And for this, so uh, Jimena um, injected a retro AV in the parafascicular nucleus, and then she looked in the cerebellar nuclei. And then here we can see the dentate, the interpose, and the vestigial. So we see that all of them project massively to the parafascicular thalamic nucleus. So we looked at the effect of purkinia cell cerebellar theta stimulation coupled with the chemogenetic inhibition of fibers between the cerebellar nucleus to the parafascicular nucleus. So to do so, we use CNO, so uh, chemogenetics, CNO and inhibitory dreads specifically in the cerebellar nucleus to the parafascicular nucleus. And uh, we look at the behavior. So uh, here, uh, if you remember when we start in the preventing group, when we start the stimulation in the same time with the levodopa, we can uh, prevent the apparition of these abnormal movements. And then we did the same. So we did uh, purkinia cell cerebral theta stimulations, but this time we inhibit in the same time uh, the projections from the cerebellar nucleus to the parafascicular nucleus. And in this case, we see levodopa in this dyskinesia. So we cannot uh, prevent anymore the apparition of these abnormal involuntary movements. And this, so this shows that um, these specific projections from the cerebellar nucleus to the parafascicular nucleus are required for the levodopa in this dyskinesia alleviation by the Purkinia cell stimulations. So yes, cerebellar parafascicular pathways is important for the therapeutic effect of Purkinia cell stimulations. So we showed um, during uh, Berenice's thesis that um, the cerebellum is an actor in the normalization of the behavior. So we see the effect on the orolingual uh, dyskinesia and also on the cerebellocortical uh, pathway and on, on the cerebellostriatal pathway in Parkinson's disease. So now to end, I would like to, to say a few words also about dystonia. So dystonia is this neurological pathology characterized by the simultaneous contraction of antagonistic muscles, leading to involuntary movements and postures. And we know that this is a circuit disorder. So it involves basal ganglia thalamocortical and cerebellothalamocortical pathways. And here we see, for example, structural abnormalities, so changes in the gray matter densities, in the cerebellum, thalamus, and the sensory motor cortex in one dystonia. So this is the writer count dystonia. So we also know that the cerebellothalamic alterations are present in genetic forms of dystonia, and they are predictive of the penetrance of the disease. And dystonias are associated with abnormalities in synaptic plasticity in the motor circuitry and may result from pathological learning. So we studied a genetic animal model of basal ganglia disruption dystonia. And in this case, this is a new familiar monogenic dystonia, so DIT25, called GNAL, uh, that calls for G alpha ALK. So this G alpha ALK is important for the signal transduction in the striatum. So this is in collaboration with the NIRVE, and we participated to the validation of this model. So this model is a presymptomatic model when the mice are young adults. They do not, they do not see, uh, show any dystonic movements or postures. 
But then we can inject oxotremorin. So this is a muscarinic agonist. So in, in the striatal or systemically, so this will mimic the hypercholinergy that is present in the striatum in dystonia. And with these injections, we can have an abnormal motor score. And also we can see that there are uh, dystonic movements and postures. And now with Hind, Romain, and Laura, we ask what are the changes in the cerebral, cerebral coupling in dystonia. And to do so, we uh, implanted uh, optical fiber antinorodopsin in the cerebellar nuclei, and then electrodes in the thalamus. And we recorded the mice while stimulating in the thalamus, while stimulating the cerebellar cortex. So we did this in what we call presymptomatic. So as I told you before, uh, spontaneously, there is no dystonic posture. And then we induce dystonia. And then we wait later when there is no more dystonic uh, postures, and we call this asymptomatic post-induction. So here you can see the effect in the thalamus of the thalamic cells when we stimulate the dentate um, uh, nucleus of the cerebellum, and we see this in the presymptomatic and also in the asymptomatic post-induction of the dystonia. So these are examples. But when we look at all the data of the cerebellar excitation of thalamic neurons, we can see here that in the presymptomatic already, we have this increased excitability in the cerebellothalamic circuits in the dystonic mice. And this aberrant excitability, it's amplified post-induction of dystonia. So we see that we have this abnormal potentiation in the genome mice that suggests a functional impairment of the cerebellothalamic pathway in dystonia. So we also looked at cerebellar stimulation, theta burst stimulations in this model. So this time we use the same protocol as the, the study before, but this time we applied this protocol in the cerebellar nuclei while recording in the thalamus the activity. And we look at the responses of the cerebral uh, thalamic uh, pathway before the theta burst and after the theta burst. And it's what you can see here. So here are examples. So responses in the thalamus uh, in the pre-theta burst in the genome mice and oxotremorin, and then post theta burst. And when we look at all the data, we see this depression in response to cerebellar stimulation. So we have a depression that occurs on this overexcitable pathway. So it normalizes the excitability of the cerebellar uh, thalamic circuits. So we see that we have this abnormal depression in the cerebellothalamic pathway after cerebellar theta stimulations in the genome mice. So this suggests that we have this normalization of the excitability of the cerebellothalamic circuit in the oxotremorin induced dystonia in genome mice. So can this normalization also play a role uh, in the behavior? So to answer this, we look at the dystonia score in the wild type and genome mice after the theta burst. So we did this uh, over three days. And here you can see, so in the genome mice, you see that the cerebellar stimulations decrease dystonia scores in the genome mice, suggesting an improvement of the condition of the animal. So as a general conclusion uh, for the cerebellar forebrain pathways in Parkinson's disease, dyskinesia, and dystonia, uh, I showed you that the basal ganglia pathologies alter cerebellothalamic function, and that cerebellar stimulation can correct the basal ganglia dysfunctions. And now uh, we'd like to figure what and where are the plastic phenomena taking place during the motor disorders. So I would like to thank all the team that we are co-directing with Clement Lena. So I present you the data from the physiopathology. But we also work on the motor and emotional learning and spatial processing. And um, if you want to come to Paris to work with us, we have two postdoc positions available. So write us. I would like also to thank the founding, uh, to thank Reza again for the invitation. And thank you all for your attention. Oh, Danielle, that was what a lovely convergence of human work, fMRI stimulation, non-invasive stimulation, and animal models. Thank you so much for that. Let's, uh, let's see if you have open it up for some questions for Daniela. Sure. Maybe I can start up um, by asking you about how 
the loss of dopaminergic input to the striatum might result in changes in the um, baseline activity of Purkinje cells and nucleus neurons. So do you think that dopamine by itself might have an effect on the property of the neurons in the cerebellum or is it, or is it the input to the cerebellum has somehow changed from the mossy fibers or, or other things? So yeah, this is this is a very interesting question. So uh, it would be really nice uh, to know this. So uh, it's hard to say that it's really direct because uh, there is evidence sure of some dopaminergic receptors uh, in the cerebellum, but it's not so clear um, if we really have um, a dopaminergic role in the cerebellum. So. Uh, we wanted to, to put a cannula and to inject dopamine into the cerebellum and see exactly what's happening. Or maybe these days we should, with the delight, uh, look at the dopamine while we are doing this to really see if something is happening in the cerebellum. Um, but I will say that this is more uh, a compensatory effect. So I, I don't think it's really directly linked with the uh, dopamine, at least in, in our hands, what we know for now. But I think it would be really nice to follow this and to yeah to follow the dopamine. Know that we can do this online uh, while we have the lesion to see exactly uh, what's happening in the cerebellum, also on the dopaminergic side. Maria, please go ahead. Do you have a question to ask Daniela? Sure. Thank you very much for the great talk. Uh, I have a probably naive question considering the CBI data. Uh, as you are showing that like if the decrease and CBI uh, is quite, you know, not, not very stable in humans. So I just wonder, was it tested that it's really the same timeline and it's like it's a real decrease or it's a different timeline? And also like using your wonderful approach with animals, like may be tested actually real timeline of CBI and, and also it's somatotopy because this five milliseconds, it's it really puzzles me all the time. It's really short. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Maria, for for this question. So yes, this is a uh, this is important to know. And sure, we I'm not sure that we really look at um, I mean in, in detail at the time, timeline. So what is what is was really impressive for us because we look after to see uh, once we saw that we really have a decrease in the cerebellocortical functional connectivity in Parkinson's, we look to see um, if this is something that was seen in patients. So. There are not many reports on this, and um, I guess that this is really hard also to uh, to do all the time because it involves already um, mus muscular uh, response because we stimulate the motor cortex and we look at how the muscles are. So it, it must also depend exactly where we look. So, but um, it has been shown that if the delay is uh, it's bigger, there is no effect. So, which really means that I think it's a way to read the functional state of the cortical uh, functional connectivity, cerebral cortical functional connectivity, at least um, at one moment. But now if we, if we I think at the um, study where I show you with fMRI that in Parkinson's, uh, during the execution of the movement, we can have um, a moment when we have uh, the overexpression of the cerebellum, but then it just a few minutes after, it's, it's just not there, a few moments after. So probably we should really look better at the at the timeline, and also for the somatotopy, I think it's um, it's not hard to do. But I mean, in humans, uh, we can also do this in uh, in mice. We didn't do it. So for the somatotopy, we are very happy to to have the L7 channel rhodopsin transgenic mice because we could really uh, in the study with the level of disease kinesia at the time could really stimulate cruise to orolingual look at orolingual movement. So we really were in the in the same uh, circuit, uh, but for Parkinson's, yes, I, um, I I'm not sure that uh, that this is uh, this is known already. Yeah. Thank you very much, Rich. Uh, you had raised your hand. It was actually a very similar question. It was about trying to kind of hear your take on kind of reconciling why the you know resting state shows sort of like some increased connectivity. 
uh, uh, functional studies show, you know, increased recruitment of the cerebellum, and yet that uh, really striking drop in the uh, uh, CBI response in, in the Parkinson's uh, uh, patients, both on and off medication. Just trying to think, you know, hear your your thoughts about how you kind of reconcile the, the, those those different observations because they're they're really quite striking. Yeah. Yes, this is this is really striking because sure, if we look at uh, one structure. Uh, we can see the activity, but then sure, um, if we see this hyperactivity in the cerebellum, probably it's really linked as a compensatory activity, what we show in the animal. Um, so the cerebellum really tries to, to, to move, to, to increase the tonus. So then um, will, there will be um, more activity in the motor cortex because in Parkinsonian, uh, in Parkinsonism, we know that there is this decrease in the motor activity in, of the cortex that is linked sure with the akinasia and uh, um, the symptoms in the Parkinson's. So I guess that the hyperactivity is more linked with that, is the fact that the cerebellum tries to, to increase this activity. But then uh, probably there is a, a, a limit in this because we have this uh, disconnection between the cerebellum and the cortex. And um, um, even if the cerebellum is it's really overactivated, maybe it can't be even more so then it goes through thalamus and the cortex in the case of Parkinson's disease uh, that it's quite, I mean, advanced. In the case that we look at with the dopaminergic lesion, we are in a very advanced, uh, if we want to compare very, very advanced state of the, of the Parkinson. Yeah, I was wondering if, um, I mean, obviously if the Purkinje firing rate was uh, elevated in the uh, um, Parkinson state, then doing the uh, uh, stimulation might not, you know, <laughs> Be able to really increase that in a significant way, but is there any evidence in your animal models of elevated uh, uh, Purkinje self baseline sort of firing rates change? Uh, we we really thought also that um, uh, because the increased activity can also come uh, from the cortex or from the uh, from the Purkinje cells, so what we saw in the cerebellar nuclei. So we didn't know how to look at the Purkinje cells. So we were um, so we saw cells that are not changed. So they do not change, not all of the cells change. But what we were surprised is because we had these uh, seven transgenic uh, mice that we could have with the optrod, we could go down, uh, stimulate, and from time to time we had the silent cells that they did nothing. We could just see some complex spikes from time to time when we stopped and record them, but they all the time uh, answered to the cerebellar stimulation. So um, probably it's, it's really, um, uh, what we tried then, I mean, it's really hard to see. We didn't see us, I mean, in our hands, increase for Kenya cells. We only see decrease or no change. So that's why we said maybe if we try to, to uh, wake up these cells, the Purkinje cells that are silent, something will happen and then we'll see an increase in, uh, in the wave, in the cerebellocortical thalamo wave. But I guess that the increase that we already saw in the cerebellar nuclei, it's I think maybe it's just already uh, some limit and then it's very hard to to push the threshold so to to really get um, an effect. Yeah, well, thank you for a really nice talk, really interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Violetta, you had a question? Hi, yes. Uh, hi, Daniela. Nice to see you again and a wonderful talk. Uh, I'm mostly interested in this cerebellar stimulation studies and um, as I'm studying the Fastigia nucleus, I know there are some recent reports on direct uh, projection to VTA and even to substantia nigra from some putatively uh, the glutamatergic long projections from FN. And I was curious what's your take on this neuronal population because you only looked at, or correct me if I'm wrong, you look mostly at the Purkinje uh, sending um, signals to the FN and, uh, sorry, to the VCN and further. To Bazalanda, but I was curious what do you think about this uh, glutamatergic populations from the BCN? Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you, Violetta. So um, we also looked at the other nuclei, actually. So I presented the, the, the most important data that we had on the interpose, which is really the main uh, nucleus that projects to the motor cortex. But we had a look on the fastigial under the dentate. Uh, and um, we saw some modifications also in this uh, in this nuclei. So then, for the fastigial to the VTA or the substantia nigra, sure, uh, colleagues, uh, I mean, for uh, show that uh, you can uh, stimulate and have effect in uh, in the VTA in the substantia nigra. You can even have effect on dopamine um, if you stimulate cerebellar nuclei in general. 
And then I can answer with this more with the second study that we did in dystonia, because in, in the Parkinson and levodopa induced dyskinesia, we uh, stimulated the cerebellar cortex because we really wanted to be specific of the oral, oral lingual uh, dyskinesias. We are lucky to have a symptom that it's really in front of it. But then for the dystonia, where it's more complex, we went uh, already with the stimulations in the cerebellar nuclei. So we did the dentate, sure, but we can really see that we have these effects on the um, um, thalamus. So you can induce the same type of effects also stimulating directly in the cerebellum. Then for the fastigial in the lab, uh, we didn't look um, in these um, uh, motor studies, but we looked uh, in link with emotional learning. So, and what we see is that if we stimulate, for example, fastigial nucleus, we have immediate response in the para area third gray matter, for example. And uh, we even show that this pathway was uh, important for, for peer learning, but this, this is a, a separate subject. So I will say that um, stimulating these glutamatergic pathways from the cerebellar nuclei, even from fastigial, for sure, they can um, uh, have an effect on the, um, on the uh, ascending pathways. Um, and thalamus and add on um, VTA and uh, substantia nigra. Thank you. Thank you, Violeta, for the question. Any other questions for Daniela? Daniela, that was just wonderful. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure to listen to this beautiful work. Thank you very much, Reza, for the invitation. And thank you all for the attention. It's really great to, to be here online with you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.